Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, this is the uh, fifth webinar of our webinar series. Um, I'm really excited to hear from our speakers today. We've got two, um, two really great perspectives coming in to give us more of an insight to the personal uh, lived experience of caring for someone living with dementia and um, a professional experience. So last week we heard from um, uh, people living with dementia themselves. So I think this follows up really nicely. Next slide. Okay, uh, so just a disclaimer before we get started. Um, that the opinions expressed today by our participants, uh, including the pre presenters, are their own and are not representative of the consortium. Um, and then a couple of housekeeping bits. Um, just a reminder to everyone to mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Uh, we've been quite enjoying um, having a chat at the end, a bit of a discussion and people are muting themselves. But until then, if people could keep themselves muted. Um, we are recording this webinar, so it will be available um, the link will be shared on our website. It'll also go out on our YouTube channel and we'll share that via our Twitter and, um, and a follow-up email as well to everyone who attended. If there's any questions you have, please type them into the chat function while people are speaking. We can um, keep a record of them so we don't forget. Um, and just a reminder as well that we will be having a, a discussion in two weeks time. So um, keep a note if there's any really big key points that themes that you're noticing coming up or things that you want to talk about. Um, to provide a quick recap on where we've been so far, um, way back in week one, we got the kind of historical context of um, the consortium that this uh, existing consortium was born out of. Um, we've spoken about policing perspectives. We had insight to technology perspective. Last week was the lived experience perspective on dementia and wayfinding. Um, I had to steal this quote from Christine who uh, shared it with us last week, not all those who wander are lost. Um, so yeah, it was a really, really interesting to hear just the, just the unique differences. And I think that's what really came out for me is everybody is different and, and how we support people going forward, it's gonna have to be quite um, personalized. An overview of today. Um, first, we're gonna be hearing from Rachel. Um, and then we're going to do a Q&A for Rachel, just a five minute opportunity so that if anybody, um, so that you don't forget your questions, we'll have a five minute Q&A then. Then we'll move on to Ron, he's going to share his experience with us and then we'll have a, an extended Q&A at the end. Um, as always, we'll do a quick wrap up and an opportunity for people to ask who have to leave on the hour, but if not, um, we'll have a continued discussion and that will be uh, recorded for anyone who can't stay on. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to ask Rachel to get her slides up and as she does um, I will introduce her. So Rachel has been working within the health industry for about five years, mainly working with older adults and dementia in several different settings. She's currently working as a frailty care coordinator in a, a GP practice within Carlisle looking after over 65 year olds in the community. For Rachel, uh, I think like many of us on the call today, uh, the personal is also professional. Uh, Rachel has personal experience with dementia as her grandmother has mixed dementia and her grandfather has malcognitive impairment. Um, in September, this is exciting, she'll be starting her nursing degree specializing in dementia care. So um, yeah, another great person in the tribe. So I'll hand over to you. I'll mute myself and you you can get started, Rachel. Oh, thank you. Let's see. Can people hear me? I don't think so. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, that's fine then. Hi, as uh, Katie said, my name is Rachel um, and I work with um, older adults in Carlisle, which is not Scotland for people who think it is. Honestly, we're not Scotland. Um, so yeah, I'm coming from the professional point of view um, today of dementia. Um, I work with a lot of people who either have dementia or have someone who they live with or a relative that has dementia. Um, 
Yeah, so as the slides say, I've been working with dementia both professionally and personally for around about five years. And um, yeah, I absolutely love it. Um, I came into the consortium last year, I think it was, when we were in Edinburgh, and it was absolutely fantastic. I stumbled across it and I'm so glad to be part of it. Um, now, a frailty care coordinator is a very new practice, especially up here in Cumbria. Basically, we assist people over the age of 65 from the GP side of things. Um, we work with community mental health teams, families, social workers, hospitals. To be fair, we work with anyone who wants to work with us, and it's fantastic to do so. When it comes to dementia, we assist with kind of the actual diagnosis. Dementia, one size does not fit all. And even if someone has two, if two people have the same type of dementia, it's not always necessarily the same symptoms or anything like that. So we help them by creating personal plans. Now, a personal plan is reviewed every three, six, 12 months, depending on what stage they're at. Um, and these personal plans include medical staff as well as social stuff. So things like what they like to do. Um, where do they like to go? What activities do they like? Who's their relatives? Who's the next to kin? Things like that. Um, we aim to put patients into the driving seat of their own care. They're in charge of it. We are here to just assist them in any way that we can. An example of this personal planning is Fred, as you can see on the screen. Now, Fred had a cognitive impairment back in 2017. The diagnosis of dementia didn't actually come until 2019, so two years later. Once he did get that diagnosis, we came in as frailty care coordinators and assisted with the care planning. Now, when he did have this diagnosis, the um, dementia was just short, short-term memory, not a lot. Um, but it was really good to come in quite early on because I went to go back and see him in late 2019, climbed a little bit, but not a lot. And in mid 2020, so actually a few weeks ago, I went back to see him and his mobility had started to climb. We were able to get the community physios involved at that point to help him with his mobility, as well as for the wife, as you will see. So the wife does not have dementia whatsoever, but Sue is still part of Fred's journey. So we came alongside Sue as well to support with appointment planning and diagnosis, as well as creating a personal plan for her as well. We found out that a lot of people who have dementia also possibly have a partner or relatives that need support. So we offer support for both partner and the patient. Um, so another way that we help, so that's the care planning and the personalized side of it. The other way we help in the wayfinding and wandering is this Herbert Protocol. Now a lot of different places in the UK have the Herbert Protocol. It comes from the police. And it, it's literally a form that contains everything that you would need if someone is still missing. As Katie said at the beginning, not all who wander are lost, and a lot of them aren't. So the Herbert Protocol has some different things in it, like um, places that they like to go. A lot of people who wander are just trying to find that place. Um, again, that is my opinion. It's not um, medically stated or anything. Um, and the way we, we use this to help tackle wayfinding and wandering, it helps us a lot to figure out where people maybe are or where they're going to go. Um, the other way that we help with this is sensors, alarms, care line is fantastic. Um, recently, we have been doing information bracelets, tags or card. If someone has something that they always take with them, it's really good to put a GPS tracker in them. We had a lady who um, she had the dementia diagnosis 
and she would always take her dog no matter what she took her dog and we just we couldn't find anything else to do to find out where this lady was going and get her back home safely so we put a gps tracker on the dog and that has worked fantastic and it's just thinking outside the box for people whether it be for wayfinding wandering or even for a personalized plan um so i have chatted a little bit but don't worry i do babble um my conclusion is kind of person-centered care is the future because people understand their care a lot better than us sometimes um sometimes when it comes to healthcare, we only look at the medical and not the social that's when my job comes in we look at both medical and social it's a way to help put people again in the driving seat of their own care and um, we are coming up with more and more technological advances to tackle wayfinding and wandering such as gps trackers and door sensors i have another gentleman actually who has a video doorbell which is connected to his son's phone anytime that front door opens the video turns on and the son can see who's at the front door whether it be a postman or a friend or if the um father in question is going out for a walk or wandering the son can see um we also are pushing more and more to work across the hospital community and third sector including adult social care age uk and all of those different um places as well working alongside everyone together and working in partnership is always going to be a benefit not just to the patients and the people with dementia but to their families relatives and us as health professionals um so yeah any questions really brilliant thank you rachel that's um that's a breath of fresh air to have someone there be so under the time <laughs> um, thanks I suppose while um, while everyone else is getting their questions, either typing them up in the chat box, I might just kick us off and ask you, um, could you maybe explain a little bit more to us about like the role of a frailty care coordinator? Because I'm just not sure how much that exists internationally, a, a specific role to help someone develop a personalised care plan. Yeah, not a problem, Katie. So, um, frailty care coordinator is just one word for the job that I do. Um, we are known as welfare coaches, lifestyle coaches, um, coordinators, planners. There's so many different names for us. Basically, all we do is we come alongside um, a person and we get to know them, we create a relationship and we try and make sure if we try and make sure that their voice is heard in a way a lot of people sometimes can't get their voice or opinion across we are there just to support them to do that coming in from a health side it does help um especially when it comes to hospital avoidance so avoiding going into hospital making sure someone has their say on whether they want to go in or not um, and different things like that. Does that kind of answer the question? Yeah, and then we have a follow-up question from Ruth in the comments, and she says, um, Rachel, I'm wondering if you always have buy-in for your involvement, and how do you get referrals or patients identified? So with the referral and the identifying, we have a computer system called EMUS, which is basically all of the health records of someone in our um, general practice um, or GP surgery. Um, we get referrals through from doctors, social workers, um, advanced nurses, nurses, health cares, anyone really can send us an email or send us a message either telephone um, or through a referral form and um, saying if they're worried about someone um, if they are worried, what we do is we give them a phone call, explain who we are and if they would like some involvement from us. Another way that we identify patients on a proactive way, so actually 
looking for ourselves is we can search through the patient database. So we can search for patients who specifically are over 65 or who have been in hospital a lot. Um, basically, anything that we think might be helpful for them, we can search that in our database. And would you have much of a wait list then of people wanting to get in touch with you or is it more you being proactive? A lot of the time it's us being proactive because it is such a new role as um, you said before, a lot of days in the UK might not have us. Um, we do have a little bit of a wait list of like about trying to contact people about a week, a week or two weeks is a wait list for us. Um, but the nice thing is there isn't just me, there is a team of us, there is one of us in every single general practice in Carlisle at the moment um, and Cumbria. Um, so depending on what um, surgery you are with, you can contact that surgery and that's how you can get in touch with us. And then we'll follow up with a phone call and if needed a home visit from that as well. We try not to see patients or people in the actual surgery we want to see them in a home environment so that they're more at ease. Brilliant, thank you. Um, does anyone have any, any more questions? Feel free to type them or, or unmute yourself. No, okay. If anybody, got, oh, oh, we do have one here um, from Basola. Um, Thanks for your great presentation. Uh, what strategy, strategies do you implement to involve family members in the care of their relatives? That's a fantastic question. And again, it all depends on the person. Um, a lot of people who we work with, they want their families involved and they'll either be at that first, what we call consultation or meeting. Um, and they'll kind of, see who we are and they'll still be in touch throughout the process. Other people don't want their relatives involved and it's all the person that we're caring for's opinion, it's what they want. If kind of the strategies that we have at the moment is um, when we give the person a telephone call we'll say do you want any of your family members to attend? Would you like us to contact them? you want to talk to them kind of doing it all from the first stage there are some people um, that we have to contact the family first before we even see the person because of um, how quickly their dementia or cognitive impairment has declined um, so yeah we try and involve family members as much as we can again it's at the discretion of the person that we're caring for it's all up to them they want family members, we'll try our best to work around them. So whether that means staying late and meeting family members later in the day or meeting family members separate to the person, we're happy to kind of put them first instead of, oh no, I can't, I have ice cream at that time or no, I can't, I have another meeting at that time. I make sure to put everyone's um, feelings first and try and put everything in a scheduled order for people there. So, yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Um, okay, we'll hold off any more questions uh, until the end. And for now, we're going to pass over to Ron. Um, Ron's a special person because he is uh, the person who actually introduced Nolana and I on Twitter. So without Ron, there would be no consortium. Um, and I've got a bit of an introduction for Ron. Um, so he is an active advocate for dementia caregiving, aging, and research oh, We've got a bit of um, And as a caregiver to his father who lived with Alzheimer's for 10 plus years to age in place at home until January 2018, Ron utilized technology, community, creative strategies, and access to research. Um, to support his family's life to live well and as best as possible. Ron has been invited internationally to present to many groups such as Dementia and Alzheimer's Societies, Police Services, 
researchers in academia, healthcare, and industry on several topics related to dementia, aging, being a carer, and innovation. With numerous committees that Ron sits on and advises for, two of them are partnered with the International Consortium for Dementia and Wayfinding. Um, these include Dementia Advocacy Canada and AgeWell, which is Canada's technology and aging network. And that is where he is co-chair for the older adult and So with that, I'm gonna pass over to Ron. Thanks, Katie. Um, hopefully that audio uh, doesn't create an issue, but hi everyone, uh, good morning. Um, I think we're all good here. You guys can hear me well. I'm coming in clearly. Uh, I'm actually using two systems here. So uh, uh, I'm not the typical presenter. I don't use a PowerPoint that much. So I'm using something a little bit heavier called Prezi. Uh, but good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you, wherever you are on this uh, planet of ours. Uh, I'm Ron and uh, Thank you again to Katie and Nolana um, for the amazing work you've done in such a short time. Uh, I'm gonna kind of give a little uh, credit to the younger uh, academics and researchers. Uh, for some reason, you guys work a little faster. Okay? You guys uh, have a different mentality and I'm hoping that there's a shift there, that it's uh, not simply about uh, from the academia side, uh, uh, doing pilot projects and just getting work done for work's sake. Uh, it's actually for making an impact. Uh, and and uh, again, the uh, consortium here, uh, I do appreciate the work you have done in such a short time to get the international community, community on board regarding these challenges that I personally have lived with. Okay? And uh, when I went through this, uh, this was simply a, a time that I had no access to research or even to this. Okay, I'm hearing that echo, yeah. Uh, to the knowledge of... Uh, of what could be done, right? So I had to figure it out a lot myself, and, and that's what I'm going to talk about a little today. I'm not sure where that audio is coming from. Let's see. Is everyone muted? Just want to make sure everybody else is muted. Yeah, I'm just reviewing. I'll just keep an eye on making sure everyone is muted. Okay. Thanks there, Katie. Yeah. Um, but okay, so all of you can see my slide here. Um, that's uh, me here, uh, Ron Baleno. Uh, my contact details there, uh, a profile page. I'm not on LinkedIn, um, but you can see a link there. Uh, and uh, my Twitter. So that's actually where I met Katie. And uh, that's where I met Katie. Hmm. The technology gods are not helping us today. So, but let's give this, yeah, let's keep at it here. You guys will hopefully get, you know, I might not even talk. I'll just show you the slides. That might be the better way. This will be the most silent conversation presentation ever coming from me here. Okay, so, okay. Here in Canada, we use the word caregiver, okay? And in other parts of the world and anywhere, um, words do get tricky, okay? And I always need to start my presentations off with that. I need to make sure that, that I think we get really caught up on words I get it and I know the power of words, okay? But I also know how it disempowers and it makes issues with me and other carers out there, okay? Because sometimes I believe we actually uh, stress out the community, okay? Us as experts, as those that are trying to make it better, might sometimes make it worse by telling people, okay? Versus letting them choose what words work for them, okay? so. There came a point in the 10 years that I was caring for my dad that I was using whatever words. And then when I started coming to this community, I was being told, no, the better word is this. You should use this word, Ron, not that word. And uh, I kind of said, you know what? I know, Katie, you sent me the email saying, uh, please use person-centered language. I'm breaking that world already right now. Okay? That's something that I respect and we should, as a community, uh, use to move forward together. But individually, okay, I'm not going to stress out other individuals that might call themselves a care partner, a carer. They might just recognize themselves as a son, daughter, husband, wife, all these words and many more. Okay? So that's just something I always need to start off with all my presentations, that my intent is not to trigger someone. Okay? And that's a key part with words, okay? the intent. 
And if many of you don't know the, the nursery rhyme sticks and stones, okay, and I realize many don't, but sticks and stones may break my bones, but names and words will never hurt me, okay? And as we've grown up, I think somehow in the dementia community, we allow words and names to affect us. Again, I get the power of it as a community, okay, to reduce stigma, to uh, improve the work. But again, sometimes in the community that's just being introduced to, to dementia, sometimes it's not about stressing them out, in my opinion. It's about empowering them to be able to better react, okay, respond to situations, to challenges, okay? So challenges like what my family has had to deal with, uh, you know, when my dad goes missing, okay? So I'm gonna try and do this presentation in less than 10 minutes, and Nolanda knows I always go over. Uh, so thank you, Rachel, for helping give me that extra few minutes of time here, okay? So a little background. Who are these two people, okay? For our friends that are here in Canada that have seen my presentations, you will know what this is here. Uh, I introduce my mom and my dad, okay? That's my mom, Ronces. Uh, full name is Ronces Vale. Uh, that's my dad, Reynaldo, okay? When you add these two together, you get that great looking person right there, okay? Um, and his name, okay, when you put them together, okay? Filipinos have this habit of putting names together, okay? Mashing it up and it becomes Ron. Aldo, okay. Maybe when I talk louder, that thing comes out, that echo, but no. So it's Ronaldo, okay. So that's my full name, okay. But unfortunately, for some people, when they put it the wrong way, I was lucky here, if they do it backwards, okay, uh, I, I could have been called racist, okay. And if no one knew how that spelled, I would have been called racist my whole life. So that wouldn't have worked well, okay. On our care team, okay. We also have this feline. His name is Lucky. Now, I am an only child, okay, but Lucky has helped uh, in our lives here. So, Lucky's a cat, as you could tell, um, but to my mom, Lucky has become my brother, okay. Uh, if we're talking about person centered care, you know, there's cat centered care, animal centered care. Like, so this is Lucky, a little profile about Lucky. Uh, that is Lucky here, okay. Lucky likes to read. Now, I bring up Lucky. For a reason because Lucky was part of our care team and if the video works later you will see Lucky in action okay that's Lucky. Uh, I'm gonna go through this quickly uh, again um, I'm trying to put a two-hour presentation into 10 minutes here you can ask me questions later but pretty much that is the background with my dad uh, uh, diagnosed uh, in 2007 passed in 2018 at home that was our goal okay to keep him at home, but I was getting prepared to put him in a care facility, but he passed away in a sleep at home, okay? Here are some of our challenges that we dealt with. Okay. Uh, some of the community members that we had on our team. Okay. okay, and I'm gonna try and see if this video works. And if it doesn't, you kind of saw my dad there briefly. And maybe it'll pop up. If it doesn't. So that's just a little flavor of who my dad was, okay? Uh, and uh, his, value, his value of playing music, okay? Uh, just some associations and organizations that I'm involved with uh, here, AgeWell, uh, if you don't know who they are, check them out. Center for Aging and Brain Health Innovation. Sorry, the slides are moving a little faster. Um, Dementia Advocacy Canada, who's a partner with the International Consortium on Dementia and Wayfinding with us here uh, and another group. So just some groups there that I just wanted to throw out. So this is where it gets a little unique. Um, I actually approach caregiving as a game, okay? To me, that was my strategy of taking it on, okay? Uh, right now, okay, it's a game. Oh, there it is, it's popping up. Uh, I won't go into it in detail, but for me, 
all the challenges we dealt with fits into this game for me. I've always went back to this and say, what do I need to address? Okay. If I picked a challenge of someone that goes missing and wandering like my dad did, these were a lot of the variables I had to deal with, the different individuals, the people in the game. I was dealing with emotions, finances, time, energy, and something I call psychographics. It's not actually mine, but I bring it into this world. Okay? That's what I dealt with or dealt with. Uh, fear was a big one, okay? um, under emotions. Okay? Uh, financials, the cost, okay? so we could simply say GPS device, but what's the cost? Okay? What does a caregiver go through to come up with all these solutions? Uh, the time it takes, okay? the time to learn technologies, solutions, just to even be aware of the problem. Okay? Uh, the sleep, the issues that we were dealing with, focus, you know, making sure that you know, while I'm working during the day, I'm thinking of dad, okay? things like that. When I'm sleeping, do I even sleep? Because I'm worrying, will he get up and leave? Okay. Uh, and then I come back to psychographics. The one that I talk about a lot is values. Okay. What does my dad value? What do I value? I want him to walk. I want him to do what he wants. I want him to go to his church. I want him to go uh, to the store. Okay. That was my goal. Um, and that's how I approached it. Okay. And that could be like a whole day's presentation on just the game. Okay. Keep moving on. And uh, let's see here. In this game, um, I'm picking the elephant, dimension of the elephant, as someone that weighs us down, and then how do we actually balance our lives out a little better, okay? That's what I kept trying to figure out. How do I make it better? Not how to make it perfect, but how do I make it better, okay? And uh, the way I did that here was with just a, a list here, okay? Here's a list of some things. I needed knowledge, technology, team, you know, um, understanding choice, Okay, sometimes it's luck. Okay, those are some of the things I had to deal with. Okay, so I'm almost more than halfway done here. Just uh, time check for me. Okay. This part, I'm going to pause for a second as the audio clears up. Well, you can take a look at this. Okay, so I left out some of the points that weren't part of this presentation today, but the key part for me is becoming a better calculating caregiver. We're constantly trying to figure things out, okay? And that's not talked about. What goes on in our minds, okay? When my dad's missing, okay? Or when I'm trying to figure it out, okay? And I talk about the ROs, the return on. And a lot of you know return on investment, ROI, okay? Uh, return on time, and it's coming up here on your screen in a second, hopefully. Uh, okay, there it is. Uh, return on technology, any RO that's out there. Okay. Besides the top two that most people know, throw in whatever RO that is. What's the emotions that someone's dealing with? The quality of life, their values. Fill it in. Okay. And it's different for everyone. Okay. You know, that's a different type of, uh, that's a powerful question to kind of ask someone, what's so important in your life okay, that we want you to, to access? Okay. So you fill it in. Okay. That's how I do it. Uh, th these are all numbers to me. Return on the numbers. And fortunately, what that does is, is actually a great acronym because that acronym comes up as uh, the return on the numbers, which should be popping up here any time. Uh, and if not, there it is. It spells my name, okay? So fortunately, it's the Rons, okay? So if you ever get lost, just remember, well, what's Ron talking about? He always talks about the numbers, the calculating, okay? What's important to someone, okay? Uh, one comment here is uh, I always say that we are constantly failing. I'm going to talk about failure. Okay. Um, to me, dementia is simply dealing with dementia is dealing with failures in life. Okay. Even if I take the word dementia out, it's just, okay, my dad's trying to get somewhere and we're failing at that. Okay. We're failing either. Is he coming home? So that's how I looked at it. Okay. I even tried to keep the word dementia out of it. Just what do we need to do to continue moving forward? Okay. My acronym for fail is to always find another important lesson. The beauty and ugliness that comes with dementia is that things get repeated sometimes. So if you love learning, okay, dementia is a great space just to learn. Okay? There's always something to learn. Uh, and you get a, sometimes a second and third chance at it, especially people that might be at risk of going for a walk, wandering, going missing. Okay? The sad ones are the ones that only have one instance of failing 
they, an incident where they fail, person goes missing, and they're not found or they're deceased. That is the sad ones for me, okay? But there are chances where you could learn from that. And a lot of caregivers or carers, okay, uh, across the pond, uh, you guys use carers over there, uh, they don't understand that it's going to be repeated. And that's where I think a huge gap is that we need to do as a community have to work on, okay? That I've talked to many carers, okay? And they said, yeah, dad's gone missing, you know, four or five times, He's, but he comes home, okay? No, it just takes that one time. And that's where we're missing that, especially even the first time. And we don't have really on this team, and it's hard to get the doctors, okay, to get to the table here, okay? They're the ones that actually will say, this is what your dad has, Ron, okay? And of course, he'll forget. That's the most common one that they'll share, okay, that we all know. But forgetfulness does not harm my dad unless there's a physical harm, okay? That's the one that I'm concerned about that no one ever told me about, okay? So uh, that's the one space I think we need to bring some attention to is that that moment when a carer acts, okay? And the only time I've seen carers really act, okay, is when they, uh, when, uh, hang on, sir, sorry here, is when they feel that pain point, that emotional pain point, okay, of fear, okay? Okay, until they feel that emotional pain point of fear, a lot of them are gonna say, yeah, mom goes for a walk and she comes home late, we don't know where she goes, okay? They don't feel that. But until someone has gone missing, like my dad one time, after the fifth time, okay, he went missing and we had to call the police, then it dawned on me, okay, we have a challenge here, okay, and this is gonna be repeated, I need to figure it out, and that's where I went to get GPS devices, a door sensor, you know, Rachel was talking about that. This is 10 years ago for me, 10 or eight to 10 years ago. Uh, door chimes, video cameras. Now there's all challenges with that as well. There's privacy, ethics, you know, uh, human rights issues that I won't go into right now, but uh, it's just one of those that we need to kind of address to the care community is that, okay, this is a dangerous situation and I'd prefer to kind of throw in the fear conversation earlier than later, okay? That's my personal opinion there. Okay. My value, as I finish off here, uh, you know, can for dad, the incidents we dealt with is I want him to, uh, oh, sorry, what did I have here? Uh, can for dad, incidences of Ray, my dad, uh, incidents of Ray, not where I want him to be, okay? So the key here is that I'm gonna share some, some of the examples of where he, was where I didn't want him to be, okay? And uh, the I want versus what does he want, okay? That discussion is that in the end, the team's view was we want him to go wherever he wanted. That was my goal. Many, many carers don't look at it that way. It's like, I want him to be restrained at home. I don't want him to go out, okay? That's some of the conversations that I hear mostly. I went a different route. I want you to get out go ahead, you know, go wherever you want that, okay? Now, here's the issue with that, okay? Um, if he can go wherever he wants, okay, you know, that's great, but we have challenges, okay? And in all honesty, all the work we're doing right now, we have answers, the answers are there, okay? okay? The answers and solutions for my dad to be free as much as he wants is available to us, but there are limitations, that's what happens. The challenges, um, that are out there uh, with someone that goes missing would include stuff like safety, uh, risk of injury, risk of injury, not just to himself, but to others as well, okay? That could be the case. He could cross the street, a car try, could avoid him and maybe hit another car, whatever the case may be, okay? So things like that uh, is something that I solve, I'd like to solve for, but in the end, give my dad the biggest space, give him, you know, five kilometers to walk, give him a community where they're all caring for him and know that he's safe, okay? Uh, give him technology, okay, so that if he's in a spot that uh, he's not around, uh, we could find him, it's there. But there are a lot of barriers. So the bottom line for me is, it's just let's work from that perspective. Of do what you want, but then what are the barriers that stop you uh, and prevent you from uh, getting back home safely, let's say. Okay, so that's really my approach there. Um, we still got 15 minutes here, but I will uh, kind of, yeah, I've gone past my time, but uh, let's just show you this. Oh, here, now, these are just examples 
of how uh, my dad went missing a few times. Uh, there's like a, it's coming up here, but I'll start it off here. Uh, the obvious one is from home to going somewhere, right? So my dad, a 10 minute walk to the store, that became 20 minutes, 30 minutes sometimes. And it took us a while to even pick that up, okay? Uh, my dad getting lost in the hallways and the elevators, okay? He would ride the elevator some days and finding him on the elevator would be the, the challenging part, okay? Keep waiting at the elevator and all that time. Uh, in the mall, my mom has lost him in the mall numerous times, okay? And having the security go looking for him when my dad actually took the bus home, right? And uh, everyone was, uh, trying to find him in the mall, okay? In a parking lot, I had to rush into Costco for 10 minutes, uh, come out, and he's missing, okay? Tried to use a GPS device, but it was not accurate, okay? So uh, he just happened to walk in front of me like 15 minutes later. Don't know where he came from, okay? Uh, on the balcony, okay? He would go on the balcony and he would close the door and my mom wouldn't even think of the balcony that he's been there for two hours, okay? Uh, at a grocery store, uh, when he got lost, he went to his old workplace, uh, I walked to his church. And the one that I found out only about two years ago, when it dawned on me, the very first time he got lost was just around the time of his diagnosis was in Las Vegas. As Filipinos, we love going to buffets, okay? We go to this buffet thing. For some reason, it's a family tradition. And my dad went to the bathroom. And then we realized that my dad hasn't been back for half an hour. I didn't even put that together until two years ago. That was the first incident. And if you're going to get lost in a place like a casino at Caesar's Palace, where it's all blinking lights and all that, that's like the worst place to get lost. And if he made it out into Las Vegas, okay, that is going to be a huge challenge. Okay. So anyways, that's an example. We did find him. He stayed, uh, but that was after an hour of us looking. Uh, okay. So that's pretty much it. Uh, oh, yeah, tips. You guys wanted tips and tricks here, but I'll finish off. Uh, I keep saying finishing off, but I am actually not finishing off. <laughs> uh, it is, uh, okay, here's one tip. Okay, one, um, I take pictures of all his clothes, okay? Um, and I try to simplify his clothes. So if he did get lost, okay, take pictures of his clothes, his shoes, okay? I could look and say, well, what's missing? Is it the blue jacket that's missing, okay? Um, uh, police sometimes would say, take pictures of the bottom of the shoes, the sole of the shoes. So if there is a time where you're, at, you're actually doing a search, okay, they might be able to uh, track based on the shoes. Sorry right here. Okay. And uh, hang on here. Let's see. Let's, okay, so you see a picture of, I'm trying to get you guys to this video here but it's being finicky. Okay, this is just the one video of my dad that kind of became popular. Again, this was years ago of uh, me having a video camera in his place, okay, uh, using technology so we're not stressing out. Uh, it's coming up here. Uh, Hi, Dad. Hi, Hi, Dad. How are you? Hi, Dad. How are you? I'm over here. I'm over here. You just relax, okay? You stay home, okay? You just relax, okay? You stay home, okay? Okay, but you have to stay there, okay, Dad? Okay, you just relax. Okay, but you have to stay there, okay, Dad? How's Lucky? Okay, how's Lucky? Just relax. Yeah, where's Lucky? How's Lucky? Lucky? Yeah. Uh, How's Lucky? Lucky yeah, okay, yeah, who's that lucky? right there on the floor? Lucky? Yeah. Okay, that's Lucky. Okay, I'm gonna pause that video. I'm hearing some bad echoes, but bottom line is you saw the use of technology remotely. Okay. Um, and again, I was doing this about seven, eight years ago um, before the Internet of Things came up. Uh, 
I was using door sensors, door chimes, high tech and low tech solutions. Okay. For example, there's a low tech of a door sign telling my dad to stay home. Okay. Pros and cons to that. that did, sorry. Hang on here. We'll pause on that. Okay. You guys still, hear, still hearing the echoes? Yeah. Okay. But okay, I'll try and talk over it. The uh, the door sign okay, that works well, but it can also backfire. Where there's been a story where I think it was in the UK, uh, a, a niece put up a sign for her aunt to stay at home. There was a a, a fire and uh, the aunt came out of the home. So, sadly, she perished at home. So, okay, I'll just kind of pause and not talk. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to finish it off there. Uh, you can just see these two last pages here that I'm going to share. Um, you're going to see a picture of a tomato man. Okay, finish off. Okay, and um, an article that I have in a magazine called Dementia Connections Magazine. Uh, we're going to see a lot of uh, Canadian advocates uh, in that magazine there. Okay, so that's just uh, some tomatoes from my garden. Okay. So finish it off there. I'm sorry for this. Finish that audio. I wonder if you stop sharing your screen, Ron, with that. Uh, yeah, let me give that a try. So I could just ask everyone to share their own Okay, that could have been part of it. There we go. Um. Okay. So, sorry about that. Um. Ron, I was wondering whether um. Could we share those videos with people? Uh, there's going to be a link to that whole presentation slide and you can see that there. Uh, right. I, I, my mom knows about this, you know, uh, I've been sharing these videos already a, a while now and it's uh, something to move the work forward for all of us. Okay? Okay. It's, it's one that people can understand. Uh, uh, but I know that sometimes sensitive, someone's going to see it and say, okay, if you're sharing stuff that's personal. Well, yeah, our family agreed to that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Ron. Um, yeah, well done for a couple of comments. Well done for battling through that. Um, <laughs> but Ron is actually, ironically, the king of technology. And if I've heard him speak a bit longer and he speaks about in, in depth about all the, all the tools that he used to support his dad. Um, okay, so okay. is there any, any questions for Ron? I'll just give it a couple of minutes to either type them up or if you would like to unmute yourself, please do so. Thanks for the comment there, Chris. Uh, yes, even though I'm about technology, yeah. The, again, the tech gods were not with me today. <laughs> <laughs> One thing for sure, Ron, uh, every, all the technology I use and it's Getting to be quite a bit, Ron taught me. <laughs> so my hat's off to you, Ron. Thanks. Uh, I, I do need to address just something with Roger here. What I appreciate is this doctor of yours, Roger. Okay. The doctor was very strong to tell Roger, Roger, if you can say it in your words, something about when you made an issue about you at risk of getting lost, this doctor was really strict with you, which I appreciated. Well, this doctor's the type of person, she always has my back, but boy, you don't want to upset her. If she says to do something, you better do it because she'll call you out for it if you don't. But I mentioned to her uh, getting lost a few times and uh, uh, I remember she goes, you really need to do something about that. That's a prelude of things to come for you if you're having challenges now boy oh boy it down the road you might get in real trouble and uh, she goes you need to do something about it 
And I go, what do you suggest? And she goes, I don't know. <laughs> but figure it out. And you better have a solution next time you're in my office. So anyway, yeah. uh, it was about two days before the appointment and I hadn't done anything. And I'm starting to get nervous because I don't like her rat. Uh, so I called up Ron and, and said, hey, Ron, I'm in a peck of trouble here, buddy. Uh, can you make some recommendations uh, that I can bring back to my doctor so she doesn't tear my head off? So anyway, uh, Ron did. And I use that technology to this day. You know, I use a Safeway at Home bracelet, low-tech option. I also use, uh, ah, shit, what's it called, Ron? Life? Life 360. <laughs> yeah. Right. I have a simple uh, GPS app on my phone, and my brother and I and daughter, um, uh, they can keep an eye on me, you know. So I've been out of town, forget to tell my brother. He gives me a call. He says, I couldn't help but notice you're in Banff. Uh, do you mean to be there? <laughs> you know that that kind of thing. You know, so I, it's kind of a well. Th yeah. That's a key there, Roger. Is yeah. that team that team piece, right? Yeah. Which this is not a game, and, and I do talk about the game of dementia a fair bit. It's it's not a game uh, of uh, uh, solitaire, playing on your own as a carer. And I know there's a few carers on here that have seen me talk uh, on the topic of superheroes. It's not about being Superman or Wonder Woman. We all start as that. You know, we could do it. You know, we could take this on. And then over time, the challenges that start building up and you don't realize it. And I'm going to be blunt with the men out there. Uh, they go much further individually. They don't get the team together. Okay. Uh, I go to all the talks of cares. 95% women. Okay. 95% women staring at me. That's great. I have no complaints about that. Okay. But the men are not showing up. Okay. And they're, they're you know, breaking down. Where, when they shouldn't, in my opinion, okay? And that whole piece of having a team is kind of key. To me, that team for me was not just the high-tech expertise of whoever I can get, but it's the low-tech as well. That is more important here, okay? Having the neighbors. My dad went out the house. The sensors went off. I could try and call him if he's already made it out. I have six neighbors, okay, in the building that I could call, okay? If he made it out, okay, I had the GPS kicking in. If he went further, I had the variety store, the coffee shop, uh, the grocery store, who I trusted, all know our situation, and they would call me. So I created a bigger safety net. Honestly, I love the police here, but I don't want to be getting a call from the police or me calling the police. Okay, we've got that's way too far. Okay, so that's the work for me is all before that. Okay, but that comes back on the carer side, that we need to support the carer and make them aware. Okay, and uh, yes. Yeah. Ron, that's what I find um, that the link between yourself and, and Rachel, and Rachel, you brought up in your presentation mm -hmm. that um, it's a huge part of your role is supporting the carer. And wouldn't it have been great if when Roger got that telling off from his doctor that she said, you know, go speak to Rachel and she'll help you talk through your options. I know that you have, you're lucky to have Ron, but if you didn't have no Ron. Yeah. And, and another thing about GPS apps and all this great technology out there, when you're actually looking on Google, it's very uh, intimidating. In other words, I, I look at technology, I wonder if they share my information, if I do get it, all sorts of issues. Does it work? Uh, you know, all these different things, you know, so is it from a trusted source? Um, that's why referrals are so important to help you wait through this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I'm just aware of the time. Uh, we have one final comment. It's not a question, but just saying um, from Tea Party, Ron makes a good point about us caregivers constantly failing. And the great thing is that we do get to have a redo daily and learn from mistakes. Mm -hmm. My mom's team, are, now that she's in care, are also learning happily. Informal team, friends slash community are sanity favored. So yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm bringing up the importance of a collective approach. I, um, I just wanted to make the comment, sorry, there, okay, okay. like the learning, like even from Rachel, I'm constantly like today learning from Rachel's presentation, right? Mm -hmm. You know, of how you do it in the UK, 
right? UK, we all know, is great. Uh, you know, I'm, yeah, you're in the UK, right? <laughs> right, yeah, right. That's right. Uh, so it's. Uh, I'm just basing it on the accent. I couldn't confirm, but uh, yeah, just so that whole piece, like learning from each other, but not just learning, but can we move it faster? I sometimes feel we move way too slow, okay? Um, and we're trying to make it perfect. And sometimes for us, we just need to get the job done. Help us get the job done. And it's not about perfection. Yeah. Okay. This is why we try and have our like times so quickly. We try and actually get people and get responses at least minimum of a week. We try and get people to try and make contact just because as we know, Ron, your presentation, it helps us improve our services for yourself and for people with dementia as well. So thank you so much for presenting. Yeah. Well, um, just quickly, I think if you've joined us before, you know the score by now. Um, if you're able to stay on for an extra 15 minutes, we like to keep the conversation going. For those of you who have to leave, um, just a quick concluding remark. Um, I think today we've had really interesting perspective and um, again lived experience but I think that we need to cast that term wide. It encompasses a range of different experiences so to hear that um, care partner caregiving perspective both professional and personal and um, it really adds value to this platform and as you know as Ron you just said there you know we're constantly learning and so education is the most important thing and that's what we're hoping this platform will do. We are also aware that this is, you know, so far, you know, Nolan and I are from the UK and Canada, so it, it is quite UK and Canadian centric. So we are trying to cast net wider and, and we're aware that that's um, a bit of a blind spot for us. And um, so, yeah, hopefully that's something we can work on in the future. And um, next week we have our final week of presentations and um, the research perspective. And um, so we're going to hear, it, it's really just a, a little taster of different types of research that could be of interest to um, people who are interested in dementia and wayfinding. And then the final week after that um, is the big discussion. So anything that you didn't feel like we got to sink our teeth into chatting about, um, feel free to send us an email. That's our email at the bottom. Get us on Twitter. Um, whatever way you're most comfortable with, and we will start to frame uh, a final conversation if there's anything you didn't feel like we didn't have time to discuss in any of the webinars. So that's all from me. Those of you who have to part on the hour, you're free to go. <laughs> but um, yeah, let's keep the conversation going. If anybody has any questions, we could continue there. I have a comment. Or yeah, go to, for it. The, to the crowd here. Uh, more on the, the, I know that there's a fair bit of police services uh, that are part of this, you know, consortium, which is amazing in my opinion. And I recall back when I was just coming to this community five years ago, um, I was saying, we're, I, I did a presentation. I remember that uh, with Noel Anna and our, our good friend here, Jamie Sterling was there. And I was presenting for the Alzheimer's Society, my first presentation to this whole community uh, about the stories okay, of what we go through. And I kind of graded it from the, I had four of the presenters of carers, uh, of someone who just had their mom go miss, missing uh, and they kept finding her to one where, uh, two of them, one was, uh, he's well known in Canada, Sam No, his dad is still missing. You know, I think after seven, eight years now, um, another friend, carer, carer uh, dad went missing just for the first or second time and was found deceased, right? So kind of built that up. And I thought I was going to get the expertise from the police, from the Alzheimer's societies, from the dementia societies, from the groups and the researchers that you were the experts. And I really realized you guys still had a long way to go. Okay? You know, you guys had your techniques for search and rescue. Okay, you know, that's the strength, you guys, of, of that. But the work to prevent it is the one that I'm challenging the police services to help out the community to work. And it might not supposed, may not be from the police. Like, if we're dealing with police, we're kind of in trouble, <laughs> okay? We're further along, as I said, okay? But it's that opportunity when the police see, have an incident, and educate at that moment to that family, okay, this is the action you take, okay, to not to reduce it the next time okay that would be just like roger's doctor okay 
in my opinion, it should be coming from the doctor first, but the police services, that's my challenge to the police services is to help that education piece along the way. It bothers me when, respectfully, when a police officer comes to me and I ask them, you know, have you found anyone recently? They said, yeah, we keep finding, having to look for the same person. And I say, do you tell them to go somewhere? And they said, oh yeah, well, we should tell them to do this and that. So that's kind of the ones that I really want to work on from the police side, just to uh, help, you know, bring that knowledge piece. Um, but yeah, from the police side, I, it's again, um, I love you, but I just don't want to be utilizing you if, if, if we're there, you know, that means we're in trouble. Okay. Um, well, yeah. we, we don't want that either, Ron. Uh, but unfortunately, yeah. you know, sometimes, uh, you know, those one in 10 times, uh, uh, police, police are needed. So it's challenging. And when you talk about prevention, um, you know, I was on the, the talk show circuit there for quite a few years here in Ontario and Canada. And uh, it's a fine role uh, with police. You want to educate uh, people like this group here about the search process and that. And you want to, you don't want the people to be afraid to call the police because we are there to find that person as quickly as possible and bring them home. Uh, alive that that's our goal uh, but we you know we see the other portion of, of the job that we do too and we don't want to put fear into people to not call us we need that call uh, as quickly as possible so we can uh, find those clues and bring them home so it's a it's a it's a challenge so, let, let, let's so that way. that's a piece right there jamie when you talk about the fear it's not fearing the police and a lot well yeah. okay Okay, but that whole piece of if I call the police, I'm in trouble. Okay, I'm doing something wrong. Okay, that is work on its own space. But yeah, I'm glad you brought up the fear. To me, it should be the fear of, you know, telling the family. Uh, and I believe it, the fear communication piece of, of communicating fear is that, okay, your dad may not come home. Okay, you should be doing something. Okay, and I think that starts again from the doctor. Okay, they're the first person that at that moment is these are the challenges that might be coming now that roger you're diagnosed with dementia this you shouldn't be discovering it yourself okay you should have been told that ahead of time in my opinion right so that's yeah the police uh your friends in the community it's it's that you know hey go to your doctor and see what you could do to work on this you know things like that yeah well i, I like the, your your picture your toolbox at the start and i always say that you know there's there's a toolbox uh, uh a toolbox that we bring to all these calls and searches and not one tool will do provide you that solution. It's many tools, mm -hmm. right? And whether it's your doctors, whether it's um, the local Alzheimer's societies, whether it's uh, prevention programs uh, that are run locally in your community, whether it's government funded things or, or private enterprise, you need to have many tools in your toolbox to, to keep, keep people safe. Uh, what we found really helpful here in the UK is because my role is so new, when I first started, we actually set up a meeting with the fire service and the police to explain who we were and that um, set up a referral system that if, um, say, the doctors or anyone did have any concerns, they could come to us and say, look, could you put this person in touch? And we could kind of be the middleman. So it kind of helps people like yourself, Ron, to get away from that fear because a lot of people see a uniform and they're just like, right, okay, either no, I don't want to go near them or yes, I do. And that's how we kind of got around that in a sense here in Carlisle. And it's actually worked quite well over the last year. Um, we have created this welfare tech that police and the fire people do for us if we feel that they need if we do feel there is a bit of wandering there um, or a fearfulness of getting lost we would ask the police and the fire to just contact us and say look worry this is what you can do in those instances and it is kind of trying to build bridges between everyone i think um but i don't know if that's useful but that's kind of what we're doing here in carlisle yeah rachel i had to give you a lot of uh, applause for that because the we part is what carers don't really pay attention to. It's about, I have to do this, I have to do that. When you keep bringing up the we, and then I believe that 
if Rachel comes in and let's say police services, let's say Jamie, the police officer at that time, we're on your team, Ron. We're here to keep your dad safe. Okay. Yeah. That message isn't clear. Okay. And I think that has to be some type of branding. Okay. It's not, okay, police is over there. Okay. I'm in trouble with them. No, no. Yeah. They're on my team. Okay. We, okay. Uh, you know, that's what I really believe has to be kind of communicated to carers. Okay, from all of us in some way. Okay, the team component. We are with you. We'll support you. Okay, be aware that this is one of the risks. Okay, our friend Roger going missing. You know, Ron, your dad Ray could be going missing, and we're here to support you. Okay, on that. Okay, so that's a lot of this is about messaging and and communicating out there. Okay, that can reduce the numbers. You know, or even the severity of these incidences down the road okay so i i love that there rachel you guys are pretty good at that we you although here in canada the we organization's in trouble but that's okay that's another talk <laughs> just a group yeah, called we <laughs> i think that um the other thing that i'm noticing coming out of that little conversation that we've spoken about in previous weeks is there definitely seems to be a gap in this and um, how do we support people who return from missing and I know in the broader, like beyond dementia and missing persons generally, that's, that's an area that needs a lot more support and, and research in is, is what, what happens when people return. How do we get them back to normal life? How do we, you know, how great if, if we, as a police service knew, okay, I've found Ray, I've returned him home. And now I'm gonna, I know that the next step is to go contact Rachel. Uh, I'm just gonna, go to James because he has his want to speak card out. James, if you could just unmute yourself. Katie. Uh, Katie and Noelle, Anna, I'm not very good at speaking now, so I'll send you an email in about 15 minutes, so if you look out for it. Brilliant, thanks. Thanks, James. James has been sending us weekly emails of his um, summaries of the webinars, and so we've been uh, keeping hold of them and we're using them to see what themes we can bring up in the final discussion, James. So thank you. Bye, Thanks, everybody. James. Hi, Bye. James. Hey, James. Bye. So is there any other, any other questions or any other topics that people would like to bring up before we close? One thing about police services, uh, if I were out and about, a wee bit scrambled, getting stressed out, I, I would not hesitate to reach out or flag a car down if he was driving by, you know, I, I uh, find them, they're really helpful, really cool, non-judgmental. Uh, I asked a police officer in town here for directions and uh, it was kind of cool. He goes, uh, I read an article the other day that you were in and, and gave me a high five. Uh, it was towards dementia. I thought that was really cool. And, and I said, oh, wow, thanks, you know. And I said, by the way, how do I get here? And he says, yeah, just one block up, hang a left. And he said, do you want me to walk with you? <laughs> Isn't that cool? Who does that, right? Yeah. Really cool, Roger. And I think that's something that we've been learning over the last five weeks with these webinar series. We always hear about the bad stories, the stories that we don't want to hear about, the, the sad ones. But we don't hear enough about, you know, those with dementia that live well, is hearing about the stories as to what police do that they go above and beyond the call of duty, what care partners are doing. Like, we need more of these stories. And perhaps something that could be an objective with the consortium is maybe we can have a bunch of video that we're able to develop highlighting the positive side, the good things that can come with this. Well, they filled me out of trouble a couple of times. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm yeah. really grateful for them. And, and I guess that's why I'm comfortable, you know, if I uh, get in trouble, you know, I, I, I would actually feel comfortable reaching out to them. So uh, they're a great resource. I love them to death and have nothing but respect for them you know so win-win for everybody roger you have uh susan over here with the alzheimer's society here in uh in ontario here talking about uh japan having uh police kiosks like some small ones like these are models you know in maybe some places like larger cities like here in toronto uh, uh or wherever but 
uh, so that's coming from Susan, you know, um, and Dina, another uh, good friend from uh, an Alzheimer's Society here in Ontario, about Nolana's comment about uh, hearing the positive stories, right? You know, that that's you know something I actually agree with that we have to hear that. Uh, I just need well, to make a comment on my dad's side, but yeah, that my dad in the end it was pretty much all positive. In, in the end, you know, we had 30, 40, 50 incidences, but technically. I don't talk about them. It's there's the one or two that were serious, but those incidences were him, you know, having fun at the variety stores. Okay, uh, if I can squeeze that one in just right now, he went for a walk to the to the variety store. Okay, GPS kicked in. Okay, I start driving there. The variety store calls me. The store says, "Oh, your dad's here, Ron. Um, they have my business card, and says, would you like us to kind of just keep him here?'" I said, "Yeah, thanks. Uh, if you can just ha have him hang out there." And I said, what was he doing there? He said, oh, he bought some lottery tickets. Okay. And my dad is very far along his dementia right now. And I said, you sold them lottery tickets? And I said, they said, yeah. I said, okay, how am I going to tell that story that my dad, who's not supposed to really be out and about, if he wins the lotto, okay, you know, the million dollars and all that, you know, lost wandering and he wins it. And it's like, okay, how do I tell that story? Right. Well, at this point, as you can tell, I'm probably not, didn't get that money. You know, we didn't win that. But yeah, that. But that's more the point of uh, that was a fun little story. And they got to just hang out with my dad for about 10, 15 minutes, right? They were very good with that. And uh, so wandering could be also a beneficial thing if it's done safely and properly. Yeah, that, I think that's a really good note. Nolana, you've sparked that idea in me now mm -hmm. that, that we're using the consortium as a platform to share resources, but stories are resources too. And what if we could share, you know, a collection of videos of stories and not to undermine the work that still needs to be done, but like you say, to highlight that like, the, the positive work that it's doing. And, and in sharing those stories, I think other countries could learn, oh, that's, we, we could do that, you know, and, and it would still be valuable. We actually yeah. use the positive stories for our patients to get our patients on board with kind of going to the dementia groups or going to the public library to get resources out we use those po positive stories all the time and it is true having those positive stories helps people they like yourself roger oh, i don't mind going to the police officer and asking for help we um we actually help people in my role i'll go with them maybe to a meeting with the police and say look person has dementia this is what's going on and then educating them, saying, look, don't worry. If you're worried, give myself a call. This is what my number is. And again, the positive stories that have come from that help other patients and people with dementia. So Roger, thank you so much for those positive stories. And Ron as well, absolutely fantastic. Thanks. If on that positive, that actually again is the foundation of how we live. Okay. It's not about the problems and the ugly stuff. It's like how do we get those happy moments okay and all the barriers in the way let's figure that out okay not the other way around in my opinion it's like oh there's a barrier then you don't go pursuing that we're going to restrain you we're going to keep you at home we're going to do whatever it takes so you don't get that right so that's kind of i think the spin the narrative that would shift uh so thanks nolana yeah let's make that happen <laughs> where the, the the whole the beauty of the webinar series is not only representing but katie and i are trying to figure out what what are some ideas that we can do in the future so i like this this can maybe uh, we can even talk about this further during the discussion during the last week yeah absolutely i feel like i'm going to wrap it up on this product on this high now <laughs> that we can all leave um a huge thank you to ron and rachel um for giving us your time i know that um it's a big ask Right now, everyone's got a lot on their plate. So we really appreciate it. We really appreciate you both sharing your stories. Um, and yeah, to everyone else, if you can join us, we'll see you next week. If not, don't worry, everything's recorded. Um, and if you have any questions, just um, send us an email or, or on Twitter. We okay. always love to get emails on the side. So we appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> brilliant. Thank everyone. you so much, everyone. Bye. Bye, -bye. See ya. <laughs>